Hi. Hi, everybody. Is the uh, mic? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, hello. And uh, it's fantastic to be here in Belfast, my first time in Belfast. Um, so I'd like to thank Andy for, for the invite, first of all, and for a pretty inspiring day, actually. I, a round of applause for Andy. All right. Um, so when, uh, when Andy asked me to, to speak here, um, I was excited for, for a number of reasons, but um, the name of the conference itself was, was really sort of inspiring to me, build, right? Using a word to describe, uh, that we usually use to describe something that's like physical, like building things. And this is what we do, though. We build websites, right? We create, we're building. So, and I like that. I like using those terms to, to talk about very intangible things that we're, that we're making. Um, so I'm going to talk about the idea of craftsmanship and how it applies to the web, right? How we can, how we can use the concept of craftsmanship when we're talking about building for the web using CSS. Um, I, uh, I grew up in the state of Vermont um, in New England. Um, has anybody been to Vermont out there? You people? Okay, awesome. Um, it's, it's kind of a region of the U.S. that's become known for like handcrafted things, right? So fine cheese or carved uh, cutting boards. A lot of handmade things come from Vermont. It's kind of become a brand in and of itself, like the state, which is kind of cool. And I think that's where my appreciation for craftsmanship comes from, because I, I sort of just growing up in that, I'm, uh, I think you're able to uh, distinguish something that's made well-crafted and, and something that's not, that comes off an assembly line, right? So the um, Boston Globe uh, writes about this in an article called The Brand Called Vermont. And so they say, a product labeled made in Vermont, whether herb-infused maple syrup, pineapple pepper jam, or chai water buffalo yogurt, which is delicious, um, is worth 10% more than the same product made elsewhere. Right, so they're, they're, they're saying just by being from Vermont, it's made, it's, it's sort of worth a little bit more uh, because of this craftsmanship brand that's associated with the state. Um, and that's because we're thinking about um, products from Vermont coming from somebody with their two, you know, being made with their two hands and not something that's spit off an assembly line. Um, it's also about, you know, details, right? So attention to details. And, and some of those details are maybe uh, unobvious. They're, they're, they're not obvious, right? These, these details are not obvious, like, like a well-made piece of furniture, for instance. Um, you might not notice how well crafted it is until you start using it, right? You bring it home, you start using it, you pull out the drawer, and you might notice the dovetail joints um, that, that, that are, that are in, in the drawers, right? So that's, uh, it's a detail that's not always obvious on the surface, but um, the sign of something that's well-crafted. Um, so I like to think that when something is well-crafted, it reflects that a human was behind its design, right? That, that you can sort of feel that two hands were behind the, the creation of this thing. And we can apply that to, to the web, too, when we, when, we, when we build for the web. That um, there are sometimes not obvious details in websites, and it's not until you start using them, putting them through tests and such, uh, that you realize how well-crafted it is. And these details, um, I think, sometimes separate great design from just plain good design. So, I'm going to talk uh, essentially about nine details. I'm going to share nine details. Um, these are details that I feel sort of help make a well-crafted website. They are sort of uh, associated with CSS in this case. Um, the first couple are, are essentially bulletproof tests. Is a, bulletproof is a term I'm using for sort of flexible web design. And some other ones are going to be about CSS3 and how CSS3 helps us become uh, better craftsmen of the web uh, more efficiently and how we can all use it sort of today. So more on this, this topic of bulletproof, um, which is a word I've sort of been using the last few years when talking about, um, you know, design that's adaptable to worst case scenarios. Um, the idea of bracing, uh, embracing flexibility on the web and protecting your design from things that might happen. Um, like there's less or more content in your design. Is it, does it fall apart? What happens to it? 
um, I think that flexibility kind of becomes the mark of a true craftsman, right? Um, there's a uh, fantastic article, probably my favorite article on web design. Um, how many of you have read uh, John Alsop's A Dow of Web Design? I'll list apart. Yeah, a few hands. Okay. So I highly recommend going to read this because this is sort of written 10 years ago, but so relevant today. Um, and so he talks about the journey begins by letting go of control and becoming flexible. Uh, we should embrace the fact that the web doesn't have the same constraints as the printed page and design for this flexibility. As designers, we need to rethink this role to abandon control and seek a new relationship with the page. This is all wonderful stuff. Highly recommend this article because it's, it sort of uh, speaks to what the web is as its, as its own medium uh, from the perspective of a web designer. Really important article. So let's get into these details I was talking about, these nine details. The first one is one of these bulletproof tests. This is kind of, the first few are very simple things to keep in mind while you're building. But they're details, right? They're details that, that you might not notice on the surface of a website, but when you start digging in, um, they're important, right? So what do, I mean, what do I mean by turning images off? Here's a very simple uh, example. You have an uh, image, background image, let's say, with some text overlaid on top of it. Um, if images were slow loading or turned off in this case, this is what they'd see, right? That's not so good. So, uh, always remember to add a background color behind, sort of an equivalent color behind images in case they're not there and in case they're slow, slow to load. So, a, a good web craftsman would ask the question, what happens when images are turned off? You might say, well, who turns off images and why do I care about that? Um, a little story. I received an email from uh, a reader of Simple Bits, my own site, um, not too long ago. And he basically said, oh, I love the site, but I, I can't quite read all of it. Um, and I had to ask him, well, what do you mean? Um, so he was sort of in the middle of Iowa in the United States, um, not near a major city. So he didn't have broadband internet access. Um, he was still dialing up with, with uh, dial-up internet, if you can believe it. Um, and so what he did was, to save time, he turned off images. That's the way he browsed the webs, with images off. That sounds terrible, right? But it's what he did to, to be able to use the web um, without killing himself. Um, so, so at the time, I was using this, this technique called faux columns, which essentially is a repeating background image behind your content to give the illusion that there's two equal height columns there. And you're... Yeah, you're just seeing a white box, but um, the contrast is a little high there. So uh, essentially, here's what it, here's a really a dumbed down version of what it would look like. With images off, like this gentleman from Iowa would, would see this. Um, and the sidebar content disappeared completely because the text color was the same as the background color page. So he couldn't even read the sidebar. Um, he could sort of almost read the, the main content area. Um, so again, this is, a, a situation where it would be important to add background colors behind that, that image um, so that he could read this, right? And that, you know, someone on a mobile device, for instance, where the images are loading slow can read the content immediately and not have to wait until the, the image is down. Um, here's a, we're going to pick on somebody here. This is MLB.com, sort of Major League Baseball's uh, website. If we hide images on this, you can see the, the, um, Navigation disappears, essentially, because there's no background color behind there, and there are white links on white background. So that's not so good, right? Um, they uh, subsequently fixed that, and um, now when you disable images, you, you get a black background behind the, the header, and um, now it's still, it's still readable without those images on, right? So that's, you know, that's a detail of craftsmanship to me, um, something that you wouldn't notice just by using the site normally. Um, but a hole where there could be a problem. Okay, so number two is use the dig dug text text test. How many people uh, have played this game? Dig dug. Yeah, awesome. One of my favorite games ever. Um, 
So Dig Dug, and I have a little movie here, for those of you that have never played it before. Um, this is sort of a, a, a video game from the 80s. Uh, Dig Dug is the little space guy that digs down in the ground, and then when he finds an enemy, he blows it up until it pops and bursts, right? So when I, when I talk about the Dig Dug text test, I'm talking about sort of using uh, the text size widget in your browser to sort of blow up the page to see how, how large things can get before they sort of break and fall apart. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a good way of sort of text, testing the flexibility of your designs, right? Using that, that text size widget to do that. Um, and we're not just test, testing like, you know, what happens when a font size changes. It's, it's also we're using that font size change to, to see if more content or less content can fit in certain areas of the site without it busting apart and have it still be readable. Uh, it also, you know, enables you to, to use relative font sizes with confidence, right? Because you know if, if font size is adjusted at all, it's not going to bust the design, become unreadable. So to pick on someone else again, this is bestbuy.com, a retail chain, large retail chain in the U.S. Um, if we bu uh, bump up the text size here, we can see some of the, the navigation starts overlapping on the top. Um, everything's designed in a very fixed width. Um, at the bottom here, you see s some things overlap and disappear behind the footer here. Um, so, you know, this, this is sort of designed very rigidly. Um, so if one paragraph becomes two, uh, things could, could fall apart, right? Not very flexible. So what we want to see when we use this sort of bump up and down a few notches is things to stay intact. And here's an example of sort of the header and the, the modules that are in this page adapting to different font sizes. And this one's, this is, we're in good shape with this one because everything sort of stays uh, within a certain container that it's in. Okay, number three is um, run, run the 10 second usability test. Um, this is essentially taking away the design. Why you're, this is something I do a lot when I'm, when I'm building something uh, in code. Um, taking, essentially disabling style sheets completely, getting rid of the CSS, and sort of seeing if the site is still understandable and readable. And then it's a good way of taking an x-ray of the document and making sure the structure makes sense. So you get a sense of how this document um, looks with the browser default styles, right? To see how a screen reader, for instance, or um, a device that doesn't support CSS would view this, this document. Amazon.com, um, perhaps you've heard of them. Uh, we can disable styles on this, and the first thing we see at the top is content goes here. Simple. <laughs> That's the first thing on the page, right? And we scroll down, we get their awesome matrix of images here. Um, That's great. Uh, this is a little better. Uh, there's the matrix again, I don't know why. Uh, it gets a little better down, down near the bottom because they're using s some more semantic styles here. They're using lists and, and things. Um, so obviously, they're not using web standard semantic uh, markup to the fullest, um, and that's probably why they're, they're probably not going to go anywhere as a business. Um, <laughs> but I mean, they're, they're doing fine for themselves, so it's easy to pick on them because, well, they're, they're okay. But uh, so... Here's, an, here's a contrasting example, McAfee, obviously not in the same business space as, as Amazon, but if we disable styles on McAfee.com, we, we see immediately it's like well thought out, right? It's, it's well thought out from, from the, under the hood. And we, we've got semantic lists and we've got images. Uh, everything is, is um, organized correctly. That's nice. And that's going to look, uh, that's going to work well on, on, on screen readers. Um, it's going to work well on, um, you know, mobile devices that don't support CSS, for instance. Um, a, lot, a lot more room for, for, for error there. So this is, it's not a scientific test, but it's something I do like quite often when I'm building. Sort of, as I'm applying CSS, take it away, uh, look at the markup, make, make sure things are intact. Okay, so that's that. Now number four is no, no one to worry about validation. And anybody remember these, these little buttons you put on your site? How many people put these on their site at one point in time? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Me too. Um, 
this was like a badge of honor, right? My site validates, and uh, I am awesome. Um, and then, you know, you come to realize that this, it's hard to keep stuff validated, right? You've got CMSs that spit out bad code. Um, we're not in a lot of control, or we're not in 100% control of validation, so, um, and, and in the end, it doesn't matter completely, right? Uh, there are cases where it does matter, though, and that's sort of while you're building. So I still pay attention to validation while I'm, while I'm building something. So here's, here's an example of, of that. So we've got this tugboat template I'm building. The sidebar has disappeared, and I'm wondering where it went. And so, well, I'll validate the markup and see, see what happened. So I validate the markup, and oh, I found an error. And I forgot to close a div. And it's the wrap div that covers the whole template. So I'll fix that. I'll add the closing div and reload the page. And there's my sidebar, right? So here's a, here's an, uh, a situation where validation helped immensely, right? Because I was sort of wondering where the sidebar went. And my first thing to do was to validate the markup and find out where the problem was, right? So don't worry about validation as a badge of honor thing, right? Because that's kind of a waste of time. But worry about it um, f like during construction, while you're building stuff. Because it's still a valid uh, way of, no pun intended, uh, handling things. So, right, it eliminates head scratch and CSS problems. From a, from a CSS standpoint, uh, valid markup will help Im immensely. Um, there's a quote from Yvonne Chouinard, who's the uh, founder of Patagonia Clothing Company. And he wrote a book about the history of, of the company. Um, it's a great book. Uh, so he talks about the idea of, of an 80 percenter. Um, and he says, I've always thought of myself as an 80 percenter. I like to throw myself passionately into a sport or activity until I reach about an 80 percent proficiency level. To go beyond that requires an obsession and degree of specialization that doesn't appeal to me. Um, this sort of resonated with me because I, I think I'm an 80, 80 percenter as well. Um, and I think with validation is a good example of that. Um, to, to not worry about that extra 20 percent, right? No, no when to, to, to worry about uh, certain things and when not to worry about certain things. And it's okay if you don't know the 20 percent or don't, uh, don't care about it. Now, HTML5, I mean, how many people are, are, are using HTML5 out there? Yeah, right. So uh, what about validation with HTML5? Uh, HTML5 has much looser rules about validation, right? You can do whatever you want. You can put in up, uppercase, not use quotes, and not close tags. And all that's great, except for problems like the one I showed, where an, a, a closing, you know, missing a closing div actually affected the rendering of the page. Um, so we don't, I don't think still, correct me if I'm wrong, have, a, have a, a decent validator that would check XHTML syntax for an H HTML5 document. Um, that's something that someone's got to build. I'm sure someone's working on it. But that's something that would help immensely in terms of switching over to HTML5. Because personally, I, I still like to keep strict rules on the markup for reasons like, like I just showed. So um, we have this bulletproof dashboard, essentially, uh, sort of covering the last four things I talked about the 10 second usability test, sort of disabling styles, turning off images, making sure they're still readable, validate the style sheets as you're building, style sheets and markup as you're building, and then the dig dug text test to sort of check flexibility in your work. And all of these things, um, I think, are sort of craftsmanship tools, right? They're, they're, they're covering a lot of details that sort of go unnoticed. They're the dove dovetail joints of websites, essentially. So good stuff to keep in mind. OK. So we're going to talk about CSS3 now. And so using CSS3 as a tool for craftsmanship and how it, how it sort of helps us efficiently create experiences. Now, I hear this a lot, right? So I can't wait to use CSS3 when it's, when it's finished, uh, when it's done. Um, uh, the good news is that CSS3 is, Maybe it never will be done. I don't know. But it's, it's, uh, it's modular. So uh, different pieces of CSS3 are being rolled out. The browser makers are sort of 
uh, dictating th this, this support. They're rolling out support as they want to, experimentally in some cases. But this is pushing stuff along, and it's enabling us to use CSS3 now, which is fantastic. Um, and we have sort of core, core uh, CSS3 properties that work today, right, that have pretty decent um, support. And even IE9, right? This is, I'm using IE9 for the, for the um, chart here, but I don't know why they haven't implemented Text Shadow yet, but hopefully that'll be coming. Um, but so we have these, these um, small set, at least, of properties that have very decent support. And then we have other parts of the spec as well, like transforms, which have decent support, transitions, uh, and animations as well. Um, and uh, IE9 beta, yeah, animation's not looking too good. Um, IE9 beta uh, just announced recently that they're, they're going to support 2D transforms, right? That, that's exciting. Um, so this stuff has legs, and, and it's, it's definitely usable. It's, it's sort of the future, right? And I think we can start using it now if we sort of think about uh, using them in a progressive enhancement type of way, right? Um, that is, you know, not worrying about it looking the same in every browser, but rather giving the modern browsers the good stuff and being okay with it not looking the same in others. Um, I realized that we'd been progressively enhancing since the beginning, and, and even the first website I created, I was using progressive enhancement. So I, I thought I'd, I'd tell you a little story about that. Um, uh, the year is 1996, and I was living in an apartment in Alston, Massachusetts. This is a, a photograph of the apartment. Um, I was very poor. I was also obsessed with the Atari 2600. Any other Atari 2600 fans? Yeah, not as many as, wow, okay. Not as many as I thought there'd be, oh well. Um, well, so I, I was obsessed with the Atari, and I have been for a long time. I never got one as a, as a kid, and I was pretty upset about that. Um, instead, one year we got, uh, my parents got us the Odyssey 2. Um, I don't know if this made it over to, to, to the UK. Odyssey 2, anybody? No, right, well, it's probably a good thing. Um, you know, you can, I love the photo because you can sort of see the dads, like, pleading with the daughter. Uh, see, it's just like the Atari. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's not at all. We, instead of Pac-Man, this was what we had. Um, and it was called, what was it called? Casey's Crazy Chase. Um, and... Pickaxe Pete was probably my favorite game. Every game had an exclamation point at, at the title. They were just that desperate. So I never, <laughs> I never had an Atari. And I, I, was, um, I was troubled. I, 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 <laughs> it, it somehow scarred me through a lot of my life. And, um, but it became the, the reason why I created my first website ever. And um, so it's good for something, right? Uh, and so as a, as a special treat, I thought I'd share with you my first website design. And here it is. Pretty nice, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, forgot. I forgot that. Uh, uh, this is awesome, right? I mean... God, CSS3 would have made this easier. Uh, so one of the things about this design is the, is the font. Uh, this was a font, this is another thing I was obsessed with at the time, this font called Neuropol. Um, I thought, at the time, I thought it was the best font ever. Um, it's a, I don't know, it's a kind of a terrible font, actually. Um, but anyway, I wanted to sort of, I wanted to use it, and I wanted to use it in the site everywhere. Um, and I didn't really know, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. So the, the, the piece of software that I was using, I, I believe it was uh, part of the Netscape family. Uh, I don't remember what it was called, but, um, you know, sort of created these font stacks for me, thankfully. So I would say, well, yeah, this is all Neuropol. Um, and if you happen to have Neuropol, you'd see the site as I designed it. Um, not a lot of people had Neuropol back then, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but it provided a backup. So what we're doing is, we're, this is progressive enhancement, right? 
we're saying if you have NeuroPoll, then show that. If you don't, show these other things. So from the very beginning, we're sort of we're doing that with, with simply with fonts, right? So progressive enhancement, a, a term coined by uh, Stephen Champion um, back in 2006, I think. Um, progressive enhancement presents a viable approach by enabling the delivery of information as demanded by the users while embracing accessibility, future compatibility, and determining user experience based on the capabilities of new devices. Um, so I, I love that, and I love the user experience part of that. That, you know, I use, like to use this example. Uh, it's like watching a television program on a black and white TV, and then uh, watching the same program on a, a color HD TV. It's the same content, it's the same message. Uh, so we're, we're letting the capabilities of that device determine the experience at the end. Um, and that's, that's progressive enhancement. And, and I mean, folks didn't start, or they didn't uh, continue to film in black and white when color TVs came out. They, they filmed in color and let the, the black and white TV stay black and white. So that's what we need to do as web designers. And if we ask ourselves, do websites need to be experienced this, exactly the same in every browser? Um, I have a tendency to uh, register really long domain names. And uh, so this one is, do websites need to be experienced exactly the same in every browser.com? And that's the answer that I came up with. Um, now, this site looks very similar in every browser that you pull it up in, um, as complex as it is. Uh, but it's not until you start using it that things change and things come alive. So when you hover over this, now we've got this spacey background that comes in and some CSS3 stuff that's, that's happening. Um, at the experience level, right? The experience layer. And I think that's the point where we can, anybody can add, oh, yeah, there he is again. Um, Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> that's the point where we can add CSS3, and anybody in this room can add CSS3 today, um, I think. Because if we, if we concentrate on that experience layer as the point in which we, we add it, um, it becomes much easier to sort of uh, let go in older browsers. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. So we've got you know, a foundation of web standards, markup and style, and then we've got this experience layer at the top. And that's where we're going to add the stuff. Here's a good example, right? This is Farouk Atesh. Uh, his website in uh, the sidebar, he has his elsewhere links. Hovering over them is when things happen. And this is all CSS3 with transitions and sort of transparency. And, and things come alive when you hover over the, the links. Perfect, um, perfect point uh, to do that. Now, this is uh, the same site in IE7. Um, and when you load it up, it's basically the same site. Uh, it's not until you roll over it, it's a little different and the experience isn't as exciting, but that's okay, right? They're never gonna know what, what they're missing. Okay, so let's hovercraft the experience layer a bit. Uh, another example, this is a site that I, a, fict a fictional site I, I designed about things that we left on the moon. And up in the uh, top here is, is sort of a simple navigation system, list of links. And when you hover over those links, that's when a little bit of CSS3 is added, right? So we've got uh, sort of a, a pill-shaped rounded, rounded uh, background to it. Uh, it's using RGBA sort of transparency, and it's got a transition on it as well to sort of smooth out the, the, the changes. Um, this is like, uh, you know, surprising and delighting, right? Um, which actually Frank talked about earlier. Um, it's a good place to surprise and delight, sort of on the interaction of the site. So to throw some code at you a little bit, um, to, to, to sort of style those links, this is what I'm doing. I'm, doing, uh, I'm using border radius to, to get the pill shape, and I'm using vendor prefixes so that, that WebKit browsers and Mozilla browsers and then IE9 um, and future browsers can, can get this as well. And don't be afraid of vendor prefixes at all because they're part of the standards process. Like they're, they're attached to proposed standards, so they're not hacks. There's a big difference. Um, 
and they're sort of important to sort of push this stuff along. And then I've also added a transition. Uh, here's a transition stack that sort of helps all the browsers, Opera being dash O. So the changes, when, when something ho is hovered, the color changes and the background color changes. And the transition is what's smoothing out those changes. So the, the code to do this is, is rather simple, to get sort of a, something a little bit more polished at the hover level. Now this is what happens in IE7, and it just changes color, it just brightens up a little bit. And that's fine, right? Nothing missing. Well, a little bit, but. Um, okay, so we can talk about op using opacity for sort of uh, using, uh, cr enhancing the experience as well. Um, this is a blog by um, Square Girl, squaregirl.com. Square so in the sidebar, she has these uh, uh, images, and they're sort of slightly transparent, so they're picking up the background tone of, of, of her blog. And when you roll over them, that's when they sort of come to full opacity. And uh, this is a really nice effect, because you're using just one set of images. You're not using sprites to sort of uh, show different, two different sets. It's a real simple way of enhancing the, the hover um, with just opacity and a transition, essentially. So you know, by default, the opacity is at 50%, 0 0.5, and then on hover, it's brought up to, to 1. Really simple. I use this on, on Dribbble, uh, the 404 page, uh, for the logo. <clears throat> and the logo is... Um, semi-transparent and it's, it's brought up to, to life with a, with a hover. And that means I can change the background image without changing the, <laughs> without changing the, um, without changing the logo image, right? Because it's, it's sort of sitting on, it's semi-transparent. And it's changed the way I thought about cats, no. It's changed the way I thought about um, uh, creating the assets like, that I'm using, right? For instance, the, the logo here is actually it's a fully black logo. And I'm, I'm using uh, opacity to, to not, not just set the hover, but also to set the, the initial state as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm creating it black, and then I'm using CSS to sort of iteratively adjust things on the fly uh, without having to go back into Photoshop. So that's helpful, very helpful. So um, Megan uh, touched on multiple background images a little bit, and, and I'm going to as well, um, because I think they're, they're awesome. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's reason enough, right? Um, how many people have, have uh, visited Silverback site? Yeah, awesome. So when I, I, would, I think the first time I visited this site, I, I did this for hours, like just, <laughs> just dragging the, uh, the thing back and forth. Um, and it's, it's awesome. So what's happening here is a parallax scrolling effect, right? Um, and I'm gonna play it again. Uh, as you resize the browser window, these layers of vines, which are actually four different semi-transparent pings, are shifting in different directions to create sort of a three-dimensional effect. This is fabulous, and this is actually a great example of craftsmanship, really, because, I mean, not everyone's going to see this, right? Not everyone's going to notice this. If they happen to change the, the browser window size, they're going to see it. But um, it's just absolutely fun. Um, and so at the time, this was... Uh, released, I believe Paul from Clear Left, the person that designed this, wrote it up an article about how to do it, and it involved sort of multiple um, divs to, to contain those four images so that you could position them differently and, and make them slide around. Um, multiple backgrounds make this a heck of a lot easier, right? Um, and the support for that is pretty good, uh, including IE9 beta now supports multiple backgrounds. Um, so we can do that sort of parallax stuff without adding extra markup which is great. So on this uh, Things We Left on the Moon site that I was showing you earlier, uh, we were using uh, multiple backgrounds to, to create sort of a, a three-dimensional space effect, right? So as you move the window back and forth, things move in different directions. And this is how it's, this is how it's done, really. Um, essentially, comma-delimited images, right? Um, and so with different... Uh, varying uh, horizontal placements. So experiment with large negative percentages, for instance, to get things to move in opposite directions as, as the browser window is pulled back and forth. Um, now, how, what about browsers that don't support this, like IE 8 and below, for instance? Um, they actually ignore this entire rule, uh, which is not necessarily what we want. 
So what we can do is provide a fallback. So creating, um, using one of the images as a single declara declaration first and then letting the multiple one override that for browsers that do. That's, that's the best way to do it. And you can create a composite if you wanted to of uh, flatten all of those layers and use that for, for, um, for IE. I've chosen to just use one of the images from the stat because I'm lazy and I don't, don't want to bother. But um, the, the key here is to, to list critical background images first and then override it with your multiple declaration. Okay, number eight is um, be subtle with transforms and transitions. Um, how many people have played around with transforms and transitions already? Yeah, okay, fantastic. So. Um, here's, a, here's a very simple example of sort of using scale transform and a transition. So we have a list of images here, a horizontal list of images, um, very simple. Uh, this is what it looks like without CSS on it. So I've made the images quite a bit larger than they need to be so that I can size them down uh, by default and then uh, scale them up without stretching the image um, later with CSS. So, uh, and here's the, here's the transform. So, Transform stack for all browsers here. We're saying uh, transform scale one and a half times the size that they are normally. So if we uh, plug that in, we'll hover over images, and that's what we get. So uh, what's nice about the scale transform is it, it sort of doesn't uh, affect the rest of the page. It pulls it out, and it doesn't pay attention to margins and padding or other things around it. It sort of just pulls it out from the center, or you can also specify a direction in which you want to pull it out from. Um, we could add a box shadow to it, go a step further. So this is the box shadow syntax. So now we've got some dimensions, so when we, yeah, that looks more realistic, like it's coming off the page. And then finally add a transition on the transform. So what, we, what we're transitioning here is the, the scaling, right, to smooth that out. And, and this is what we have, right? So this is something that, you know, previously wouldn't be possible without Flash or JavaScript, right? But with all CSS and a few lines of CSS, really, we're just doing that. So that's pretty cool. Now, uh, what about browsers that don't support that stuff? Uh, like IE uh, 8 and below. Uh, this is what they'd see. That's it. <laughs> um, they don't get that stuff, but that's okay, right? Because this is just a list of links that's sort of linking, off, or a list of images that's linking off. Um, and so if you're okay with that not happening in IE 8 and below, then, then much easier to go this route than to sort of think about other routes. Now, if it is a critical piece of the design, then you want to start looking at, you know, JavaScript solutions for those things. Okay, rotation. Whoa. Um, rotation is another transform, um, similar syntax, uh, rotate in a number of degrees, right? So there's very appropriate use for rotation. Um, and here's, a, here's an example of, a, of an appropriate use. Uh, this is um, outside app, a fantastic weather app that I, that I love. Um, and you notice the, the sun is, is rotating at the top of the page. It's appropriate because in, within the app, that's what happens with the sun, it rotates. So they're able to sort of take a, a ping image of the sun and position it at the top of the page and then use a rotate transform to, to make it spin. And if browsers don't support that, it doesn't spin and that's fine, right? Um, but it was easy to add. Here's another um, example of appropriate, uh, you, you, you hover over these records and the, the record slides out. Now there's some functionality in here like play and info that you would not want to be buried um, in browsers that don't support the, the transform. So hopefully that still slides out in, in, in Internet Explorer and you can still get to that stuff. That's, that's important. Right, so you need to be subtle, right? Um, you need to be subtle with this stuff. Here's a, here's a great example. Uh, actually, Tim Van Dam, who you heard earlier, uh, I believe designed this uh, earlier version of 8-bits, which I always appreciated the, the hover treatment on these sort of rotates like negative one degrees, very slight, brightens a little bit, and there's a trans, uh, transition on that as well to smooth it out. So it's very subtle. I mean, that, that's craftsmanship, I think. Um, that you, you, you might not even notice it really, 
Now, if it wasn't there, you would notice it. But um, so being subtle is great. Um, it's easy to get carried away with this stuff. Like rot you know, suddenly we can rotate things and, and transition them and scale them, and this is dangerous, right? So how many people have heard this from a client or a boss on their design? Needs more wow, needs more, yeah, needs more pizzazz, right? Um, next time you hear that, add this to the style sheet. <laughs> this is uh, hover over anything on the page and rotate it 180 degrees, <laughs> right? This will work, and here, here's what happens. Let's take a look at what happens, actually. Uh, so we're on the page. Hey, boss, I added some more wow. Uh, I hope you like it. I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, the little guy turns upside down, and the whole page does, and blah, blah, blah. You know, the, actually, the, uh, the sad thing is, is that um, th there's somebody out there, there's a client out there that would absolutely love this, right? Like, <laughs> like yes, let's ship that. Finally. Um, so it's really easy to get carried away with this stuff. Uh, so you, you just need to be appropriate with it and, uh, and be careful. Um, so the final, the final one is uh, setting a custom selection style. This might seem kind of random. Um, but again, I think, you know, from all these different details I've talked about, I hope that what comes through is that um, craftsmanship isn't necessarily about sort of wowing somebody uh, visually, it, it can be also be about these details that, that sort of people discover on their own. And um, that makes websites unique, right? It's a very unique medium. So um, if we can brighten someone's day with a couple lines of code, I think that's, that's kind of fun. So um, something we do on Dribbble is that a custom selection style. Very simple, but it's sort of, instead of the default OS color of selecting something on the page, we turn it a specific color, in this case, an on-brand pink for Dribbble. Um, and the code for that is, is, is rather simple. This is it. Um, it's a new um, CSS3 selection pseudo class, I think it's called. Um, and there's a vendor prefix required for, for Mozilla. Um, but very simple, right? Something simple that you can sort of bring back to your brand not everyone's going to notice it, or when they do, they'll, they'll write you an email. And I get, I've gotten more emails about the, the selection style on Dribbble than probably anything else I've done. Um, whoa, how do you do that? You know, it's, I mean, it's that simple. So I actually learned this from Jeffrey Zeldman. He, he had done it on his site, um, which turns a, an on-brand orange for him. Um, it's just something a little different and fun. Um, I'd like to leave you guys with a quote uh, from the Shakers. This, and the Shakers were sort of a group known for a lot of things, but partially for very well-made furniture, uh, simple, handcrafted furniture, right? And I think their philosophy sort of really resonates with, with me. Um, don't make something unless it is both necessary and useful. But if it is both necessary and useful, don't hesitate to make it beautiful. Um, I think that's a, a wonderful way of talking about web design as well. Um, that sort of, there's an important part of, of, of what you're doing, the, the content and the message. Um, get that right first, but don't hesitate to sort of embellish and make things fun and, and beautiful. Um, and hopefully CSS, CSS3, and all that fun stuff makes it easier to do that. So with that, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>